This is the Comics Alternative Manga, a discussion of horror manga 2017. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Manga. I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. And we are two academics talking about manga. And on this, actually our second episode this month of the manga series, Shay and I are going to look at six Manga horror titles. We're going to begin with Domu, A Child's Dream by Kachuhiro Otomo. After that, we're going to look at Hideshi Hino's Panorama of Hell. Following that will be Hosui Yamazaki's Mail. And then we're going to look at Dissolving Classroom by Jinji Ito. And then following that, Gold Tanabe's Adaptation. H.P. Lovecraft's The Hound, and other stories. And then we're going to wrap up with a brand new book. And in fact, uh, it's not even out yet. It's coming out next month, Neoparasite M by various creators. But before we get to those manga horror titles, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Manga is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price. Sometimes 50% off of the cover. But every now and again, you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. Like this month, you can get volumes of uh, Cross Game for 30% off. And you can also get um, Hirohiko Araki's, um, I'm sorry, Araki Hirohiko's um, book, Manga in Theory and Practice Mm -hmm. um, for 40% off. Yeah, you know, Discount Comic Book Service, they're known primarily for the comics, but as you hear Shay and I discuss every month, they also have a lot of manga at great discounts, so definitely check them out. That's dcbservice.com. Go there for all of your manga pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Shay and Derek sent you. Well, Shay, we're doing something a little different this month in that we're doing two manga episodes instead of just one. Now, earlier in October, we did, I guess, what you can call a regular review show where we looked at a couple of titles. Um, But we're coming back at the very end of October with a second episode for a couple of reasons. One, you know, we I think we were off for a couple of months. And so this is a way for us to kind of make up for lost time. In other words, giving our listeners a double dose for the month of October. But another reason that we're doing this is if the earlier October show was a regular review show of manga, we wanted to make sure we spent some time talking about horror manga because when this show goes up, Halloween is just a day away. Yeah, and um, we did this uh, last year, too, and so uh, we thought it would be a good good way to continue the tradition of, of, of spooky spooky books on the, the October episode. Yeah, I guess so. So this is the second year in a row that we've done this. So I don't know if we want to call this a tradition, although it, you know, it, it's turning out to be. Um, and, and in fact, some of the creators and even title references that we looked at last year, we're going to be looking at this year. So we looked at... Um, Hideshi Hino's Hell Baby, which is, I think, primarily what he's known for, uh, Mm -hmm. at at least in this country. Uh, So we're going to look at another one of his books, Panorama of Hell. Uh, We also looked last year at a Genji Ito title. And again, I mean, when it comes to 
contemporary manga horror, I think that Genji Ito is the most well-known representative. Last mm-hmm. year, we looked at Fragments of Horror. This year, we're going to look at Dissolving Classroom, which is a collection of uh, individual stories, kind of like Fragments of Horror, but there are some differences. Um, and, and then last year, we looked at what was at the time a brand new, and I don't even think it had come out yet uh, when we reviewed it, a uh, book inspired by uh, Hitsoshi Iwaki's Parasite, which originally ran from 1988 to 1995. Uh, the collection, again, by a variety of creators, Neo Parasite F. And we're going to look at, I guess, the follow up to that, which is Neo Parasite M. So they're going to be not really repeats, but we're going to be tipping our hats, so to speak, at some of the creators we looked at last year and, and even the, the whole neoparasite phenomena. But we're going to look at uh, some brand new stuff as well that mm-hmm. the people we haven't even discussed before. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and some of, you know, like Domu, we've we've um, talked about uh, Katsuhiro Tomo on the show before. We've, we've um, covered his probably more famous book, uh, Akira. Um uh, but uh, we haven't haven't done anything any of his self contained work on the show, so that that is a uh, that's new as well. I'm glad that you mentioned Domu, A Child's Dream by Ketsuhiro Otomo because we're going to actually begin with that title. And what Shane and I have decided to do is, of the six texts that we're looking at, we're going to go in chronological order from when they were originally published, not only in Japanese but also in English. Um, So Domu, A Child's Dream was originally serialized between, I think it was 1980 and 81. I, I'm not sure mm-hmm. if that's the original Japanese version or if that was around the time that it came out in English translation. Do you, do you um, know when uh, the English translation uh, came out? You know, I don't. I know it's been out of print for a number of years, mm-hmm. um, and so it is – volumes of it are, are kind of difficult to track down now. Um, but I don't think I know – when it was first published in the United States. Um, but I do think 80 to 81 was the uh, original Japanese serialization. I don't think Domu appeared in English until um, the early 90s, probably oh, really? at the, the earliest. That late? Um, I, I mean, I, it's possible that it was being translated earlier, um, but I don't... Uh, that, that would surprise me um, hmm. if it was being uh, brought over... Uh, before I would I would suspect it, it would have come after the um, the epic editions of Akira, which I think appeared in the mid to late 90s or not mid to late 90s, um, like late 80s to early 90s. Okay. Um, if my dates are correct. Um, okay. So I suspect it was it was um, in the, the early to mid 90s when it first appeared. Okay. Um, but I don't know for sure. Um, and, the, and the publisher of the English translation is Dark Horse, who has done a lot when it comes to bringing manga to English-speaking audiences in the United mm-hmm. States. And in fact, of the six titles that we're looking at today, uh, <laughs> half of them uh, are published or have been published by Dark Horse. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Akira, and yeah, you and I discussed Akira on a very early manga show. I think mm-hmm. it may have been our second, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. I, it, it was it was a while back. Oh yeah, and um, yeah. so that that is what uh, Katsuhiro Otomo is primarily known for. Mm-hmm. But it's worth mentioning that Domu came out before Akira, mm-hmm. and it, it's interesting in that Akira as a body of work because that's what six really thick volumes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it kind of overshadows a lot of his other stuff, uh, which is a shame because I have to tell you. Of the titles that we're looking at today, all of these uh, horror titles, just in time for Halloween, um, Domu is one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this it was far and away the uh, the favorite of the six for me. Um, oh, you, it, the I, absolute favorite. Yes, uh, I mean I'm uh, I'm a huge huge fan of Otomo, and um, I've actually I'd actually read Domu before, um, but had been 
it had been in a number of years and I forgot most of the details. Um, but one of the things was I forgot was just how beautifully drawn it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I, re- I remember it being striking and really exceptionally illustrated. Um, but I had forgotten just really, really how uh, detailed and, and beautifully textured and, and drawn the whole book is. Mm-hmm. Um, so for, for me, it was it was far and away the the, the number one book uh, of this episode. <laughs> Yeah, um, it the art, as you pointed out, is beautiful, uh, and and again, and for obvious reasons, it reminds us of Akira. Another similarity, though, between Domu and Akira is that thematically we have, to mm-hmm. some degree, some of the same things going on. Now, whereas Akira takes place in some kind of future post-apocalyptic world, Domu takes place in a time and setting that is more contemporary, something that we are very familiar with, right? In other words, our time. Mm -hmm. But the similarities, thematically speaking, is that we do have characters who have, how should we put it, uh, otherworldly powers, right? There's Mm -hmm. something about their ability that allows them to do things that other characters cannot, and these can be quite destructive in nature, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, at least in terms of Domu, with one particular character named o- Old Cho, uh, an older guy, and um, who, who, who seems innocuous enough, right? Because when we first meet him, he is this old guy who's described as kind of losing it mentally. Uh, mm-hmm. He is described as a child. Uh, is the way that he acts, and he's just sitting on a bench all day, doesn't seem to be any kind of hindrance or annoyance or even potential danger to anyone, you know, just Mm -hmm. this nice, innocent old man who is, you know, losing it cognitively. Um, But there's something quite a bit more sinister underneath the surface, and we learn that as the story unfolds. Uh, But he and another character in this book, uh, Etsuko, uh, a young girl, have this power to make people do things, to levitate, to move things, to destroy things. In other words, it's it's an extrasensory power uh, that can cause destruction or can influence individuals. And in the case of Old Cho, this power, at least in terms of the narrative, first manifests itself – again, for us as readers, um, with people committing suicide in this one housing project. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in fact, we're introduced to, I guess we could call the horror of this story, although I do have to say that of the six titles that we're looking at, even though this one is probably one of the most engaging, you know, as both Mm -hmm. of us agree, it's the one that is the least horrific Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a mm-hmm. horror tone to this, but it's not horror in the sense that, let's say, we have in Mail or Dissolving Classroom mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. the next title that we're going to look at, uh, Hino's Panorama of Hell, which I, mm-hmm. which I think is, is quintessential <laughs> horror. And I'll be interested to hear your thoughts of Panorama of Hell in a few minutes. But but this is a little different. But we're introduced to the story of Domu primarily through detectives. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the story opens, or at least the first volume in this uh, series opens with someone who's about to commit suicide, this, I guess, middle-aged man. Uh, we see him approaching a door at the time. We really don't know that it's the door that's usually locked uh, to the roof of the apartment building. He commits suicide, and then we're thrown into a meeting of detectives who are dumbfounded that they can't solve this mystery that over the past several years, there is a high concentration of suicides from this one apartment building, and uh, they're, they're wondering what the case is, and then they start digging around, and that's how we learn what's going on with old Cho and then the other characters who become main players in this narrative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to note, like you said, that this is uh, kind of distinct from some of the other titles we are talking about um, in the 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 like the way horror is present in this is distinct from the way it's it, it appears in 
others. And this, in, in this, it's primarily um, gore. It's primarily violence. Um, mm-hmm. And there are some some scenes of particularly uh, visceral and and uh, visceral violence. And the the gore that is in it is 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 pretty graphic. Um, but um, uh, it, I, I do think it's funny listening to you uh, when you said that Akira. Or that 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 Domu takes place in in like our time, whereas Akira takes place in the the future. Um, just thinking about that now is is funny because Akira takes place in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so I just I got a kick out of that. But um, um, but yeah, Domu is 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 very different. I, I think from um, the other titles we are are talking about. Um, I think um, I'm trying to. Th- Think. I think it's the only one of the books we're talking about that doesn't explicitly feature um, ghosts as well. Right. Um, uh, so it, it it does uh, it does stand apart in terms of like subject matter and, and how it kind of represents that subject matter in in a number of ways from some of the other titles. Um, but it's um, I don't know. There's just something about uh, about Domu that is it's just so just so perfect mm-hmm. it's it's just so it's so tight and um and and contained and and so i don't know but the the um the the way that otomo handles horror is i think really different from um not just in in kind of what he's what he's including in in the story but the way he kind of depicts that you know you mentioned Penrim of hell um, but some of the other titles, the the Gotenabe adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft stories, um, the Junji Ito's Dissolving Classroom, um, the the scenes of horror are, are 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 meant to really shock and and surprise, and and they're they're particularly busy and and loud in those books. Whereas in Domu, the the horror really comes from these very still uh, moments, these very quiet um, moments, and. Um, it, there's just there's just something about uh, um, and we can talk about this a little bit more when we get to the Junji to solving classroom. But there is something really effective about that quietness that that I think is is why uh, I'm such a fan of the Junji Ito's earlier work um, as compared to some of his later work. Um, but, yeah, Domu is is it's it's it, I, I don't think I would have thought of it as horror. Um, until you uh, brought it up, but it is in, in some ways the most effective of the of, of all the horror comics. It's it's horror is is um, is more kind of moving and um, frightening than some of the other um, the other titles that that fit a little more neatly into the genre. Um, did you find that to be the case as well in, in your reading of these titles? Or I mean, where did where do you uh, how, how would you rate the kind of effectiveness of those? of those moments in, in Domu. Um, I mean, yeah, I agree with everything you've said. I think that the horror in Domu is quite effective. And now I I guess in describing the powers that both Olcho and Itsuko have, the young girl Itsuko, I guess the closest thing would be something like telekinesis, right? So Mm -hmm. they can move things Mm -hmm. with their minds, so to speak. Although, you know, it's not as if they grab their temples in in making things move. They they just make things move. So wherever the hell the power comes from, they can Mm -hmm. make things move. They can move themselves. They can levitate. Uh, And and not just things like spoons or books, throwing them across the room, destroying entire buildings. Uh, And, you know, I'm with you that the – for me – in Domu, the horror resides, I guess, primarily with this character, Old Cho, mm-hmm. because someone who appears and is drawn this way, so frail, at least on the mm-hmm. surface, childlike in a variety of different ways, and not only in the way that he looks and sometimes even acts, but the the way that he speaks and his laughter, I mean... More times than not, when there is any sound coming from old Cho, it's him laughing. And it, it, I just got the sense that he's doing this like a child, like, hee, 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 ha, 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 mm-hmm. you know, almost in a high-pitched voice. I mean, that's how mm-hmm. I imagined it when I saw the laughter. And he's doing that throughout the text. Uh, and he's doing it as he is destroying things around him and taking lives. So 
the horror for me is this juxtaposition between what isn't normally horrific and what old Cho is actually doing, you know, mm-hmm. which is very destructive, um, mm-hmm. very violent. And so it's, it's that uh, off kilter juxtaposition that I think uh, drives the horror in this. And, and also little things, little touches like, again, old Cho's giggling as he's killing people and causing, you know, violent mass destruction. I mean, there's something quite disturbing about that. But you're right, mm-hmm. it's a different kind of horror than what we get from the other titles, right? So there's nothing from hell, as mm-hmm. we have in Panorama of Hell. There's nothing in terms of ghosts, as we have in, let's say, male uh, there's even there's not even any kind of insinuation of mm-hmm. things not of this world intruded upon ours as we have obviously in the Lovecraft adaptations, um, and I think maybe because in addition Domu is set in a contemporary space and time mm-hmm. um, that adds to the horror. You know, Panorama of Hell, who the hell knows where that takes place, right? <laughs> but it's it's so um, foreign to us that mm-hmm. while it is mm-hmm. horrific, we can, to some degree, kind of write it off in our minds or partition it off. It's like, well, this is a different space. And, and I think the same could be said of Jinji Ito. I mean, his mm-hmm. world is our world, but the way that he writes, and not only Dissolving Classroom, but almost all of his manga – is just so freaky that mm-hmm. again it has mm-hmm. to take place in our heads, I guess, in a different world. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I, this was a, a very effective story, not only in terms of horror, but in terms of driving the narrative. Of all of these titles, Domu was the one that, by the time I got to the end of it, I asked myself, "Where did the time go?" Am I finished already? Because I was mm-hmm. so engaged in the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that was kind of my experience as well. It's it just it, it moves so with, with in such energy. Um, but one thing that you kind of uh, got at is, is something that I, I did want to mention that there is that um, I agree with you that, that the horror of this really arises from uh, its its setting and these these little details. And there's this. Um, there's this banality to a lot of the, the, um, the setting of, of Domu. Um, it's so, uh, the setting is so quaint and so ordinary and so mundane. Um, and within that, that very banal space, you have some really violent, graphic, horrifying stuff going on, um, that no one can really explain. And um, like you, I found that that juxtaposition that juxtaposition um, really, really um, effective, and um, even more so than the the kind of fantastical settings of of some of the other titles. And um, I think that really speaks to uh, Atomo's facility with some of these these tropes and and his ability to kind of manipulate or, or subvert these tropes um, or to um, to uh, transpose this his his uh, inclin his aesthetic inclinations onto this this genre, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's just it's 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 Domu's, Domu's an interesting in title, I think, in in terms of the the books that we're talking about today, but also in terms of Otomo's uh, uh, Ovra, and it's just so so unusual, so unlike. Uh, anything else mm-hmm. that it that it is it's this just a, this weird uh fantastic uh, incredibly drawn uh book that that um is horror but it's, but it's not horror it's sci-fi but it's not sci-fi yeah um it's just this it's kind of difficult to talk about in that way um because it is it's not like any of these things that it's also kind of sort of like um <laughs> um but uh, yeah, I was I was totally just blown away again by uh, by this book. Yeah, and you know one of the things you said just a moment ago, the, the banality, the everydayness of this story, and the way that Otomo represents that throughout. I mean, I think that's very effective. For example, um, sprinkled throughout, 
Domu, mm-hmm. are these scenes that aren't necessarily, I guess, in terms of the narrative, uh, in anything like a linchpin. In other words, they're not necessary to the flow of the plot, right? Mm-hmm. They don't necessarily build on the main storyline. However, they do create a tone and they they set with the, this mm-hmm. sense of the everyday. It, it kind of accentuates the weirdness that goes on with the characters Old Cho and Itsuko and their telekinesis-like powers because that's not ordinary, everyday, and banal. And, mm-hmm. it, but, but as I was mentioning, sprinkled throughout are these scenes where young mothers are are you know who live in the apartment buildings in the in the in the complex are gathering outside and they're talking about their kids or um, what they got or maybe overpaid for at the grocery store mm-hmm. and this really doesn't feed into the plot at all but it does help set a tone another example of the everyday and the banal I think can be seen in some of the characters right because outside of old Cho and Atsuko we really have no one out of the ordinary um, mm-hmm. and I'm thinking of the detective so for instance um, the first head detective inspector Yamagawa um, he's someone and I don't think this is a spoiler he ends up well everybody thinks committing suicide but you know, he he falls within the clutches, so to speak, of old Cho. I mean, you know, but but this is a guy who doesn't have anything out of the ordinary about him. I mean, he's not an Adrian Monk. He's not a Columbo. He's not, uh, you know, any kind, you know, a Jim Rockford. I mean, anyway, in other words, there's nothing that distinguishes him in terms of his abilities or his personality. He's just an everyday guy uh, who mm-hmm. happens to be a detective who's trying to do his best. And I think you can say that about quite a number of characters. You know, the guy who takes his place, Inspector Okamura, I think is the same way, maybe not to to the same degree. And even the younger detective who is somewhat prominent in this story, Takayama, uh, again, there's nothing outstanding about him. But I think each of these characters in their own way, you know, do the best that they can, given this strange, unusual, almost otherworldly power that they fall victim to and have to try to figure out uh, in terms of Olcho and Itsuko. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing that, that you mentioned that um, it kind of clicked for me, that, that a, a really good way to describe Otomo's, Otomo's concerns in Domu are atmosphere and, and mood. This is a book that's just all mood. You know, we've alluded to it before, um, but they don't really explain what these powers are, the extent of them, where they come from, anything like that. There's never any attempt to um, explore this or answer any of these questions or explore any of these little details um, and explicate them. It's just about setting and it's just it's about mood. It's about creating this 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 atmosphere, this feeling Um which uh, I think is very different, uh, like we've mentioned from some of the other titles we've talked about. Um, but I do think that's where its, it's, it's strength really lies, that it is uh, – it's not the story, like you said, about these like super cops. Um, you know, It's not concerned with explaining really anything. It's just this story about ordinary people living an ordinary life and there's – except for this very – this one thing um, – and uh, that that juxtaposition between that ordinary and that very strange one thing uh, creates this really compelling atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's just a book that's really just really concerned with atmosphere, which I think might be why it resonated so strongly with me, because that's that's really what I'm I I, I want in you know, a comic or a movie or a book, something that's just, it's just about aesthetic and, and mood and atmosphere and like making its, its reader or audience member feel a, a, a particular, uh, way. Um, that's stuff that really, really resonates with me. Um, and, um, so yeah, if listeners uh, are into the same sort of stuff, they are going to adore Domu. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I want to comment on one other thing before we move on. Something that you said is um, certain things just aren't explained, and that's okay. And I think that that leads to, you know, the narrative effectiveness of, of Domu. I mean, for instance, uh, 
we never know how or why old Cho mm-hmm. has the powers that he has. Uh, and I think even to a greater degree, we don't know how and why the young girl who is, you know, I guess, um, you know, old Cho's opposite, right? She is the antagonist to him or maybe even vice versa. Um, if he is a power for destruction and violence, then she is one for the opposite um, and so she pursues him with at least as much power as old Cho has. But again, it's never explained, you know, who is this young girl and how did she get her power and mm-hmm. at what age? And, you know, why is it similar, but at the same time opposite from old Cho's? Again, this is never explained, but that's fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to the second title that Shay and I are going to be looking at on this year's manga horror episode, and that is Panorama of Hell. Quite a different book from Domu (laughs) is, uh, I think, maybe the best I can say by way of starting uh, He Knows Panorama of Hell. Um, What did you think of this? Um, yeah, you know, we've, we've mentioned before that, that Domu is, um, is very, very different from, uh, the other titles on, on this and, and Penrim of Hell, in many, many ways, Domu is, is very different. Uh, it's, it's very shocking. It's very gory. It's very explicit. Um, Hino, we've, you know, we've talked about Hino's work on the show before, you know, last year we did, um, Hell Baby. Um, and so people who have heard that will, you know they'll uh, recognize some of these descriptions but um he knows artwork is is very um stylized it's very cartoonish um his writing is uh it oscillates between these ex- extreme kind of silliness and extreme um graphic violence uh he's concerned with uh things like nuclear war and um infanticide and uh and and uh parents abusing their children are like recurring things we see um and blood let's not forget blood blood. tons and tons and tons of blood in this um and so in in terms of like subject matter and the way he know draws uh the his concerns his generic concerns are very very different from otomo's but uh in some ways pinner of mihel is not that different from um from Domu, uh, both of those works, like we mentioned, uh, Domu is, is very concerned with atmosphere. Panorama of Hell is is another that's it's he knows very very concerned with with mood and atmosphere. Um, the Panorama of Hell is 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 a is a sort of suite of these quasi short stories, uh, I guess. Uh, but the point in in none of in any of those doesn't really feel like. Uh, like he's trying to tell this like masterfully composed plot with these developed characters. It's about these like these incidents and this violence and these images. And it's just like uh, it's just extremity and emotion um, in in the same sort of way that that I think Domu is. Um, but it, it's it's weird. Do you want to uh, I kind of alluded to the structure of Panorama of Hell, but do you want to kind of take a crack at at describing the the plot of of uh, yeah, as much as one. there is one, um, yeah. Well, let me say first that you know this book, um, according to the copyright page, w- originally came out in Japan in 1982, translated into English, uh, and published by Blast Books in 1989. In fact, I was going to ask you, Shay, do you know if Blast Books, the publisher, is out of business now? Because I know we've talked about other manga that has come out from Blast Books. There was, you know, Hell Baby from last year. And then, oh, another one that we discussed last year. Um, oh, God, I can't remember. 
another one that uh, I, I'm blanking here that dealt with violence in, in, in an almost carnivalesque manner. Was it? Are you thinking of um, Suahiro Maruo's um, uh, Oh, Tale of Panorama Island? Is that the yes, name of it? Yes, yes, yeah. That's yeah, it. That's actually that's that actually also uh, last last. I thought that was last gasp. Okay. Well, okay. Then I'm thinking that he has been published by Blast with other titles. Yes, I okay. believe that is true. So maybe if that one that we reviewed was Last Gaffs, then others that I read around that time, kind of preparing for that show to mm-hmm. get a real sense of him or a fuller mm-hmm. sense of his work, um, had come out from Blast. So, yeah, I, I don't know if Blast Books is still around. Mm-hmm. You have any yeah. idea? I'm I'm looking online right now, and it looks like uh, they are still in business. The okay. reason we probably have not heard of them is that they seem uh, mostly concerned. And this is makes me curious why they decided to publish um, Hideshi Hino, and, and it does look like they published um, other Suhiro Maru titles. Um, but uh, they seem to publish almost exclusively nonfiction books. Okay, so um, maybe they don't do manga anymore. Yeah. Um, so these, so things like Hell Baby and uh, Panorama Hell are very, very uh, far afield from the things that they are. Mm-hmm. They seem to be most kind of uh, most known for. Mm, okay. Um, now you were asking me to describe what goes on in Panorama of Hell. I, I, I don't know if I do this in terms of let's say strict plot. Um, but I will try to describe what happens in this book and to draw parallels between Panorama of Hell and a book we're going to be talking about later today, and that is Jinji Ito's Dissolving Classroom, because I think that both of these works are very similar in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. One way that they're similar is that both deal quite a bit, if not maybe too much at times, especially in the case of Ito, with uh, body fluids. And uh, mm-hmm. I want to talk about that more when we get to Dissolving Classroom. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of bodily produced liquid, whether it be <laughs> brain, snot, blood, or what have you, mm-hmm. uh, in these books. But we definitely see that with Panorama of Hell. We've already mentioned tons and tons of blood. Another way in which both of these books are similar, at least somewhat similar, is that not only are they a collection of individual stories that in many ways could stand on their own individually. I think that's Mm -hmm. especially the case with Dissolving Classroom. But Mm -hmm. also you could make the argument that we have that in Hino's Panorama of Hell. But taken together, they represent what could be called a story cycle or in terms of comics, what I have called a number of times graphic cycles. Uh, In other words, these are individual stories uh, that could stand on their own, but there's some there's enough similarity among the various individual stories where when read together kind of take on more of a resonance. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that the stories in Panorama of Hell take on kind of a larger meaning is is through, I guess, the connecting tissue among the various stories, and that is the protagonist. And I don't know if we ever learn his name, but he's a painter. He's mm-hmm. a mad painter, um, <laughs> and he introduces the reader to him and his work at the very beginning. And in fact, throughout the book, he will address the reader. He says, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is my art. You know, this is the blood that I use. And these are the stories I tell through my paintings. And so when he introduces paintings, especially at the beginning of the book, uh, he does so he say, as a way of introducing stories. And so he has a painting about a slaughterhouse and then he tells us this story about a slaughterhouse right near his home. Mm-hmm. Or you know, another early story is of a crematorium, and he says, here's a picture of this. Oh, and this is right next door to me. And then he tells the story about the crematorium. And then later on, he ends up telling us, I think as we get into the book, this makes up the majority of it, about his family, right? So He tells us a story about his grandfather, and again, he does this by introducing us through his paintings. Mm 
mm-hmm. of course, he uses blood for all of his paintings. He uses his own blood. He even uses his bloody vomit, right? He drinks. Mm-hmm. What is it that he drinks that causes? Hydro- I think it's hydrochloric acid is what yeah. he says and every so- morning. Yeah, because he needs lots and lots of blood. <laughs> yeah, for his paintings. Uh, but yeah, he he introduces all of his stories through his paintings. But through a good bit of this text, we're told the story of his family, which in many ways helps to explain why he is the way that he is. So he tells us about his grandfather, his father, his brother, his mother, um, and so all of this, by the time we get toward the end of the book with this final story, which is like what the, you know, the, the final hell story or something to that effect, mm-hmm. you know, where he does deal with nuclear Holocaust, as, as you insinuated earlier, um, we know why he's mad. We know why he's obsessed with blood and bloodletting, not so much with killing I- except for animals. Um, mm-hmm. But um yeah, it's a collection of stories <laughs> told by a mad painter who uses his paintings as a means to introduce his story. That's what Panorama <laughs> of Hell is. That in, in a lot of blood. Yeah, it's, we can't it's, overemphasize the blood with this book. It's I, I it's mostly blood. He like uh, he like does makes like a clay. There's a scene where he makes a clay sculpture of a mushroom cloud, and then he like uh, covers it in blood and like turns it into this like demonic totem that like grants his wishes it's yeah um, <laughs> and, and he yeah he does this he tells us toward the end of the book that he did this as a child mm-hmm. and then he you know he i guess he prayed to this and wished that certain people would be killed or certain buildings burned or destroyed and his wishes would be granted you mm-hmm. know or trains would wreck or whatever mm-hmm. kind of havoc and horror he could generate uh mm-hmm. and, and then but this obsession with, uh, I guess, mushroom clouds and, and atomic or nuclear destruction uh, feeds into the final story, right? Where he says mm-hmm. that his last major work is going to destroy all of mankind through nuclear holocaust, which he's going to create. And then he'll be the only one left and he's going to paint it. It's going to be his masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but, but we learn um, – and I think it may be the story where he talks about his mother, the mm-hmm. mad woman – that he was actually born because of the atomic bombs being dropped on Japan at the tail end of World War II, that some kind of weird force um, from the bombs being dropped in Japan made their way over to um, Manchurio, or I guess for Japan it would be, what, Manchuko? Um, Although he never calls it that in the book. It's always Manchuria. Um it that force that atomic force in some way and somehow makes his way to his mother's womb and that's how he was conceived and so in many ways as he says in this book the atomic blast is mm-hmm. his father mm-hmm. yeah i'm glad you brought that up because i wanted to mention that as well um and for for listeners uh it's who weird. have have seen uh third season of twin peaks that recently concluded um episode eight there are kind of uh, antecedents of that a little bit um where the kind of this kind of like great evil is born out of uh, an atomic fire um but um yeah i'm 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 really glad you mentioned this because i was about to say that uh one of the weirdest scenes in the book is definitely the this like implication that uh the atomic bombs uh like uh, created this like spirit that impregnated his mother. Um, and then he was like conscious for all of these like war crimes, uh, while he was in the womb. And so he was born, um, with like all of these like traumatic experiences. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's so weird. And, and the, that like picture of that, like image of him as like a fetus, um, that has those like, for for people for listeners who are kind of familiar with Hino's work, they'll know that Hino draws uh, faces with these like gigantic eyeballs. Um, but particularly the oh, faces yeah. of other, or the bodies of children are disproportionately uh, their heads are, are disproportionately large, and then their eyes are are even larger. And so they have these like uh, these weird kind of sunken eyes that are w- far too big for their. Uh, two large heads. Um, and he, he has that when he draws this character as like a fetus 
as this like little tiny body like curled up uh, with like a big head and these humongous eyes that mm-hmm. are just freaky. <laughs> and many times faces are asymmetrical, right? So part mm-hmm. like one half of the face will be larger, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, almost like, you know, there are these whelps and bumps Mm-hmm. Uh, where the other side may not have that. And so it, it, it is freaky the way that Hino represents the human form, especially mm-hmm. faces. Yeah. Um, I mean, I actually am a huge fan of, of what he, of this, but, um, his kind of like disregard for anatomy, um, or like and that anatomical continuity or proportion is really great, I think. And you'll even, he even like, goes to the extreme of this of this disregard in, in certain scenes where you, he has um this painter character uh speaking to the audience um but he doesn't he know doesn't draw him with a mouth um and so he just has the eyes and um, i think think a nose is drawn in in these panels um but no mouth and he's speaking and uh you know in, it's clearly that he he know you know can can draw a mouth he just like chose not to for some reason um, because he just didn't care to, I think is probably what happened. Um, but yeah, that, that, uh, that, uh, the way he employs like, well, sometimes it's going to be kind of anatomically correct or it's going to be more anatomically correct than the others. He's just not going to deal with it at all. Um, it's this weird like quirk in, in his, his work that, uh, I actually really enjoy. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, this is one of, do I want to say the most repulsive of all the <laughs> books that we're looking at? Um, maybe so. Um, it's uh, definitely, I think, the out of these ones that we're looking at today, it's probably the grossest. Um, there are other Junji Ito titles that we've covered on the show um, that I think are more kind of disgusting and involve more uh, prominent uh, or more prominently feature uh, bodily fluids and viscera and things like that. Yeah. Um, but, dissolving uh, Classroom yeah, <laughs> is, is a good example is, of that. Yeah. But I think out of the ones we're talking about today, well, yes, Dissolving Classroom does does feature that. I don't want to undersell that that component of, of Dissolving Classroom. Um, but I think out of the, uh, the ones we're looking at today, this is probably the grossest. There are, I think, titles we've talked about on – the show before from other authors that uh, might give it a run for its money. But for, uh, for today's, for today's selection, this is, is probably the grossest. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Now, another thing I wanted to point out about Panorama of Hell, there are several examples here and there um, that remind me uh, that I think you could categorize as if not iroguro, you know, as we we talked about previously, erotic, grotesque, but at least approaching that. Now, in no way whatsoever would I say that, you know, Hino's work, this in particular, is the same thing as Shirohiro Maruo's, as we discussed, The the Strange Tale of Panorama Island, Um, because there was quite a bit of erotic grotesque, the Mm iroguro going on there. There's some of it, though, that peeps through every now and again in Panorama of Hell. And I'm thinking of, in particular, the scenes with his mother when she was Mm -hmm. younger, because Mm -hmm. there are a number of scenes uh, scattered throughout with his mother as a young woman um, tied up. And even Mm -hmm. though we don't see any sex, there's the insinuation that there may be, but also the violence, right? So Mm -hmm. she's Mm -hmm. bound she is handled as a, it seems like as a sexual object, but she's also being cut with a knife. Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. some of that Iroguro esque, if we want to call mm-hmm. it that, um, aspects to Panorama of Hell. But I, I, I don't think it's ever overt and prominent enough to turn off readers. What's going to turn off readers is the predominance <laughs> of blood and just grotesque imagery, as we've been describing. But, um, you know, um, it's definitely an experience. I, I don't. I don't know if I want to say I really enjoyed reading it. I was fascinated by it mm-hmm. more than anything. Um, yeah, I guess a couple things. Uh, I I I definitely uh, I totally totally agree with those those few scenes that um, 
I, I don't know if I would call them – they're not too – uh, too similar to Maruo, but I definitely think that uh, the way he draws those and he clothes those people, um, the the way he like blocks them in relation to uh, the blocking of the figures in relation to the audience, mm-hmm. um, I think is very reminiscent of the same sorts of like Eroguru, um, uh, woodblock prints that uh, that Maruo himself was was kind of drawing on in in his in the development of that of mm-hmm. his particular aesthetic. Um, but there definitely is that that element of of uh, of conflating the kind of sexual and the, and the violent. Um, uh, but yeah, I definitely I, I actually had a, a very different experience um, reading this uh, from you. I actually really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I enjoyed it for many of the same reasons that I, I enjoyed Domu so much is is um, Tino's aesthetic and his his the way he establishes mood, his his artwork in this is so abrasive and so kind of energetic and there is a there's a violence to his lines they the way they move uh they're they're very rough and alienating in in a certain way um and i i just thought that that look the look of the comic was i i think the writing much like hell baby um was a little weak but it really succeeds for me as a comic because it succeeds as a as an aesthetic object Mm -hmm. and it is so uh, that 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 particular look of those pages the what he does with ink um in this book um is and you know very stark contrasts between um white whites and blacks um was just really effective for me um so i ended up really really enjoying it but the things that with the the problems that you had i i definitely recognize and, and acknowledge and and they are certainly present um I was just able to kind of uh, overlook them. The, yeah. uh, well, okay, I, I don't. I, I don't think I called them problems, and I don't want to suggest that I didn't like this by saying that <laughs> I don't know if I enjoyed it, but I was definitely fascinated by it. Um, I, 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 I'm not being negative in any way. It, it's a very different kind of manga, and I agree with you 100 percent that the power of Hino's work, in particular this one, Panorama of Hell, is in the visuals. Um, I think in addition, though, one of the curious draws and I I say curious draw in that, you know, I'm fascinated and drawn to these scenarios, but at the same time, I'm repulsed by them um, are the over the top situations and sometimes actions that go on. I have a couple examples here. One is. I don't know, maybe about halfway through the book or a little more than halfway when he starts to tell us about his family and he begins with his grandfather's story. Now, his grandfather was a gambler and toward the end of the grandfather's story, we see his grandfather, uh, I guess what he's walking along one night in a snowstorm and he comes upon some other gamblers and his grandfather has this knife and when he confronts these men, instead of using the knife on the others, he uses the knife on himself. And so he starts to slit himself open. And what comes out of him, not so much blood. I mean, there's some of that because blood is always present in this book. But gambling dice. And ga- dice just just pour out of him. And then he starts to consume the dice. He starts to eat the dice. Again, this kind of over-the-top action it's just what it was my reaction and in fact in that exact same sound i made i think when i was reading this okay so that's one example another example is is toward the beginning of the book um you know i mentioned that he does tell a story about a crematorium about Mm -hmm. hell river Mm -hmm. which is this you know almost bottomless river right near where he lives filled with blood and refuse and dead bodies and body parts and whatnot um and, and, and also, I guess the very first story is called Guillotine, which we have people being beheaded. Okay, mm-hmm. so we have the people being beheaded in the story Guillotine. Then when he tells us about the story about the crematorium, what is burned in the crematorium are those headless bodies from the guillotine, right? Mm-hmm. But then in another story, he tells us about this graveyard where other headless bodies from being guillotined, and apparently they guillotine a lot of people in this world, um, are buried, and 
instead of having headstones, there are various markers, I guess like crosses, that have animal heads on top of them. And so we have these headless bodies who rise from the grave, are wondering where their heads are. They feel around and find these animal heads. And so they put the animal heads on top of their headless bodies on their necks. And they say, this is not my head. And they're walking around aimlessly with these animal heads on, on their necks. I mean, it's just over the top weird. Again, my response, huh? Um, but I think that that's part of the draw in addition to the visuals of, uh, Hideshi Hino's art. Um, his story. Yeah. I, we've got a number of other titles, uh, to, to talk about. Um, but before we move on to some of those, I do want to, uh, to mention that, that, uh, what you described a feeling kind of like repulsed, um, by these scenarios, but also kind of attracted to them is, is exactly, is exactly how I feel. Uh, I, I to- was totally grossed out by, uh, by much of Panorama of Hell. Um, but like we, we mentioned, he knows, uh, his, his artwork is so striking that, uh, that it is it, you end up kind of like putting up with that that revulsion um to uh to experience those those drawings <laughs> Okay, so let's look at the third title that we're discussing on this year's horror manga episode, and this is Hoshui Yamazaki's Mail. And this was originally published in 2004, 2005, I believe. Uh, it's, it's another Dark Horse title. It was published by Dark Horse in three volumes. And if the name Hoshui Yamazaki sounds familiar to listeners of this show, that's because I guess it was last year. Shay, mm-hmm. you and I discussed at one point uh, Hosui and Iji Atsuka's The Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service mm-hmm. uh, when that first omnibus came out from Dark Horse. And so Hosui is the artist of The Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service, but he is both the writer and artist of Mail. Mm-hmm. So this is his own work. Uh, the trans and we, you know we haven't been mentioning translators. Uh, you know the translator of Panorama of Hell. There are three people: Screaming Mad George, that's his name in the book in the copyright page. Charles Schneider and Yuoko uh, Umazawa. And I'm not sure who the translator of Domu was. I, I couldn't find that. Uh, did you? Um, no, that's a really good question. I have no clue who the translator of Domu is. Hmm. Um, um, but the, uh, the translator of Yamazaki's mail is Douglas Varinas. And, uh, this is the story. I actually really did enjoy this book. And outside of the fact that Yamazaki is also the artist of the Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service, I couldn't help but feel that the tone and the rhythm of male is quite similar, or at least definitely reminded me of, the Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service. Mm -hmm. Um, This is basically a collection of individual stories where the protagonist is a a detective of some sort called Akiba, Riji, or Raiji Akiba, And he is not just any old detective. He is a detective who hunts down these spirits that um, cannot find rest, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And so in that way, it's it's also similar to the Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service, right? Because the protagonists in the Kurosagi, you know, this team of young people in the Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service, what they do is, you know, they use their various powers to find – dead people, spirits, ghosts, what have you, um, whose, I guess, lives haven't been completely resolved. They haven't gotten to their final resting place. And so one of the things they do is, as the title suggests, they deliver the corpse to where it needs to be in order for the ghost to rest. So we have Akiba, this detective, who finds these cases – 
through a variety of different means, and sometimes it's a little unusual how he finds out about these cases. He must have some kind of extrasensory power as well, or he's a very good detective. Uh, and he finds these ghosts or these spirits, and he puts them to rest. And the way that he puts him, them to rest is with his pistol and some quite unique – or unique. You can't be quite unique. It's unique. Bullets. Now, he has a name for his pistol. It's uh, what? Uh, Katsusuchi? Yeah, uh, Kagutsuchi. Yeah, K A G U T S U C H I. So he has a name for his pistol, and he puts in these special bullets that have markings on them. And so, what he will do is when he encounters one of these ghosts or spirits um, that is longing for something, right? Uh, to be put to rest, to have answers to their questions, or, or what have you, he shoots the spirits with this pistol, with these bullets. And the spirit, I guess is kind of sucked into the bullet and then he ends he eventually takes the bullet to it's something like a monastery Mm -hmm. uh where he puts the bullets on an altar and this is where these spirits find their final rest Mm -hmm. and so they can be at peace i think it's a i think it's a shinto um shrine um which is is interesting because i think the implication in one of the chapters is that he can only see Japanese ghosts. I I think are you know what what um the one where he goes to Hawaii. Uh, there's like one line in that. Uh, yes, there's a for listeners. There is actually a, a chapter where our main character goes to Hawaii. Um, but there's a line that implies that he only deals with with either Japanese or like Shinto, like specifically Shinto spirits um which was was weird um but yeah i think i think uh he uh the place you're describing is a is a shinto temple Mm. or a shinto shrine yeah Um, um and so one of the things i found compelling about mail is the fact that we have a variety of for the most part non interconnected stories right so mm -hmm. they're they're cases and and again in in Another way that it's similar to the Kurosagi Corpse Delivery Service, where you could take any one of these stories and it would be, I don't know, something like uh, an episode of a television police procedural or something like that, that nonetheless has a supernatural twist to it. Um, Now, there are certain stories that connect one with the other. Um, And I think these appear primarily in the stories that tell us Akiba's backstory. So, for example, there is, I think it was the very last story in the first volume. And of these, in these three volumes, each volume contains six different chapters or six different stories or six different cases. Um, In the last story in the first volume, we get some of the backstory of how Akiba became who he is. Uh, We learn in this story that he was someone who, as a boy and as a young man, was blind. Uh, He was going to a doctor to work with him, I guess, uh, you know, ophthalmologist, to help him with his vision. He was eventually going to get his vision back. But right before he got his vision back, when he could see things in a very um, ill-defined way, right when he's starting to get his vision— he encounters a man, and he can't make out who this man is, but he, he sees him, or he thinks he sees him. Um, once he gets his vision, we learn, and Akiba learns, that this figure that he saw was actually not a human, but a ghost. And a ghost who basically was tasked with what basically Akiba ends up doing, right, uh, is using Katsusuchi, the pistol, and those specific bullets to help put spirits at rest, And so basically this ghost figure gives to the human Akiba, once he gets his sight back, um, the means to carry on. Mm -hmm. And so that's how Akiba became Akiba. But we also get some of Akiba's backstory in the third volume when early in that volume, there's – I think the first two stories deal with um, a young girl that as a little boy – he befriended and then something happened to her and i I don't want to give anything away here because we're approaching spoiler territory if i do uh akiba helps her let's just say uh and and this young girl uh is named what mikoto 
Mm-hmm. And so she becomes almost something like a sidekick to him in, in, in some of the other stories that follow in volume three. But again, we get some of his backstory. We see him as a young boy and as a blind young boy. And, and it tells us a little bit how he's become the person that he is now when we see him throughout the majority of these stories as this otherworldly detective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Makoto because, um, you know, like you mentioned, these are, are kind of standalone stories. But you do see, you know, across these, uh, a character, you know, develop. There is character development across these these uh, self-contained cases or, or, ch- or stories or what have you. And um, the, the, the I don't know if it was canceled or if, if um, Yamazaki decided to end it. Um, but there are only, are only three volumes. And this character of Makoto, which you mentioned, gets introduced early in the, the third one. And she does become a bit of a sidekick um, uh, to Akiba. But um, one of the things I was really interested in was the dynamic between those two characters and the relationship between them. And I, I would have been really, really curious to see how Yamazaki um, continued to develop that and refine that relationship um, over a number of other chapters. Um, so it is a real shame that uh, that uh, we don't get any more of that. Uh, but apparently these characters show up in kurosagi corpse delivery in a chapter i have not read yeah i think now that correct me if i'm wrong but that first omnibus it included was it the first three volumes of the kurosaga corpse delivery service i don't know off the top of my head but that seems that's I think consistent so. with the other um dark horse omnibuses so that's yeah. probably correct and um what I read, and I guess it was in the third volume, that – oh, yes, here it is. This is toward the very end of volume three, uh, that um, Akiba makes an appearance in the Kurosagi mm-hmm. Corpse Delivery Service volume four. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, had we gone on to the fourth volume, or I guess what would be in contained in the second omnibus edition, then we would have seen – Akiba. But yeah, it is interesting that this series lasted only three volumes. I liked it. Uh, what mm-hmm. it uh, I found it quite enjoyable. I thought it, in many ways, kind of a lighter read than definitely Do Mu, um, but nonetheless enjoyable. What did, what did you think of Mail? Um, you know, I, I think in terms of if we were to rate the books we talked about today, I would put Do Mu first, Panorev and Mifel second, and I would probably put this fourth um, because it's, I, sh- I definitely didn't dislike it. Uh, but it just, I, I, I didn't really feel strongly about it one way or the other. I think there's some really, really solid cartooning on the part of Yamazaki. Um, there's a number of really wonderfully paced, uh, sequences of panels. Um, there's some great close-ups of eyes. Um, there's just some really, really like rock solid, consistent uh, uh, cartooning in this book that I really appreciated and really enjoyed. Uh, but the the structure of it, that that kind of self-contained um, stories, more or less, um, that make up these the, these volumes in this series. Uh, it's just I, I didn't really it didn't really evoke a, a strong response one way or the other. Mm hmm. Um, so I don't think uh, I don't think I, I, I enjoyed it quite as much as it sounds like you did. Um, but I definitely didn't dislike it. I, I don't think there's a lot here that, you know, like in a couple of books we'll talk about that um, or one in particular we'll talk about that. I just didn't. Uh, there was nothing here that I like hated. Mm-hmm. You know, there was nothing there was nothing I could point to and say, like, that was bad. I didn't in, I didn't really enjoy that. Um, but I just think on the whole it just kind of left me cold in a, in a major way. Um, but like I said, it, I think Yamazaki illustrates the series really well. Um, well, you know, I used the word light, I think earlier to describe this, especially in comparison to something like Domu, a child's dream. Um, you know, I could also call something like Yamazaki's mail, something akin to comfort food. Um, mm-hmm. I find mm-hmm. it fun to read. It may not have much, nutritional or intellectual or aesthetic value. It, 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 I, okay, I feel bad saying that because it seems like it's selling it short. I mean, there is a lot of artfulness, it, both in terms of the visuals and also in terms of the storytelling, that goes into mail. It's just, 
I think the draw for me, at least, of Yamazaki's series mail is that I can get into it easily enough and Mm -hmm. then leave it and having enjoyed the ride. In other words, when I finished reading Domu, I kept thinking about it and trying to figure it out, both the story as well as the art. With Mail, I had a good time while I was reading it, but it's not as if I thought a lot about it afterwards. But Mm -hmm. while I was reading it, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and that's, I guess, one of the reasons why I mentioned something like comfort food. You know, it's like, you know, eating meatloaf and mashed potatoes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It's very, there's like a... Satisfying um, to me. Yeah, I was I was thinking it's when you were describing that it's it's it reminded me a lot of like um maybe like a network TV drama that you watch and you've watched for a while um but and you enjoy it while you watch it um but you would never ever say it's your favorite TV show. There is mm-hmm. something very very basic about it. Mm-hmm. Um but it, it kind of like it nails those basics, right? It's not extraordinary. It's not super ambitious. It's not particularly experimental. It's very elementary in a way, but it, it really there is it has a really strong sense of the fundamentals of illustration or of storytelling. It's consistent, um, and it, you know, there's nothing in it that's like particularly like noxious or like offensively bad or anything like that. Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, I agree with all that. Uh, nonetheless, I'm sad that it only lasted for three volumes. Um, yeah, this is one that I, I definitely uh, would have – I think it's it's the kind of series – and there's a number of these that we've um, we've talked about on the show before. But it's, it's, a, it's a series I think I would enjoy much more if I read it um, – if I was reading it month to month in a – in like a manga magazine, right? It's, right? it's not, it's not anything that like, I, I don't think it, it really is helped by like, say like binge reading the series, like, uh, some other series are, um, it's not, you know, a book like, like Taimatsumoto's Sunny that I just, I, I desperately want to read the next volume. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a book that like, if I was getting a magazine with like a, a dozen series in it, uh, I, I, I think this would be a great, uh, that would be a great format to read this series in. And, and I would have, I would have definitely liked to have seen, uh, seen, like I said, Yamazaki to continue to develop some of these characters, uh, further. Yeah. Well, you want to move on to the fourth title that we're looking at on this episode. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that this is the title that you were referring to earlier in terms of liking the least and being even angry with. Um, yeah. Are you men- Are you referring to uh, Dissolving Classroom by Junji Ito? Yes, Dissolving that- Classroom, Junji Ito. This came out at least in the U.S., early this year from Vertical mm-hmm. Comics. I think the original pub date in, in Japan was 2015. And, you know, if um, a moment ago I used a food analogy to describe mail, right, that it's comfort food, that it's like eating mashed potatoes, meatloaf, you know, something that you know you're going to like. Right. I mean, that's why they call it comfort food. If I were to use similarly a food analogy to dissolving classroom, it's like putting an apricot in your mouth when it's not ripe. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever had an unripe apricot and it's like licking alum. It really is. Uh, And you you without knowing it, you pucker and you grimace because it and it wasn't, you know, an unripe apricot that you think is right but it's not it's not something that you expect so i don't know if this is a a good enough analogy but i'll tell you as much as i love junji ito and and i absolutely love junji ito especially some of his earlier works you know you said this earlier um i was not impressed with dissolving classroom yes that is that was my experience well i think your analogy of a kind of unripe 
uh, <laughs> Peach is 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 spot on the money. It's something that you kind of like you you reach for it and you grab and you you want you crave because this is something that you like the flavor of, you like the taste of, you like the experience of, and then you bite into it and it is you are so let down. You're so disappointed. It is so not what you were expecting. Um, and that that was kind of my experience. I wrote about this this book very briefly uh, when it first came out for the AV Club. Uh, but it's I, I had a very similar experience reading this as I did um, reading another book of his that we've talked about. I think it was on last year's horror episode, um, Fragments, Fragments of, of Horror. horror yeah. Um, I think in in that book there is a a an introduction or a preface or some kind of like paratextual um, prose where he talks about taking a break from uh, working in the horror genre and coming back to it and fragments of horror being produced um, shortly after he returned to this genre that he was very well known for um, and that I was a fan of his works in. Solving Classroom is another one that uh, comes that he produced after that period. Um, and I think that 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 break from from horror uh, from working in the genre is really apparent in these two books because uh, whatever magic he had in the earlier parts of his career, I just think is gone. Um, you know, I think in Fragments of Horror and Dissolving Classroom, both um, they really really feel to me not like Junji Ito, but like someone who's doing a really poor job imitating Junji Ito. Um, it's you know, I, I really love like Gyo, which we've talked about on the show, um, the Enigma of Amagara Fault, which we've talked about on the show, and um, Uzumaki, which uh, I don't think we've covered. Uh, we've devoted an episode to, but we've, no, we haven't. We've, we've, we've certainly to mentioned it. it. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sure we have a number of times. Um, but those books and, and even um, s- some of the stories in in Tomi that I really loved, which um, we discussed on the show. Yeah. Um, there is something about Ito's writing that I think he does an excellent job of and his, his, um, his illustration that blends, uh, all of these different aspects of like building atmosphere and suspense, um, gross shock stuff, uh, body horror. He takes all of these kind of, um, slightly different kinds of horror, um, that can be really effective in their own right. And he kind of synthesizes them and, and, plays them off of one another in really, really powerful ways that I think make those earlier works very successful. Um, in Dissolving Classroom and Fragments 4, though, it's it's he leans so far on the gross-out stuff without uh, any of the other kind of elements that, that, uh, that elevate that aspect of his work. And uh, I just think Dissolving Classroom is just so... It's just kind of gross. It's it's kind of boring. It's, it's my least favorite elements of, of his work kind of blown up and, and expanded upon. Um, there are a couple scenes. I remember reading it and, and the, for the first time a number of months ago and, and being really struck by, I think it's late in the book when the character of Chizumi is like standing in front of the devil who's drawn in this really interesting way as kind of like Baphomet, this like winged goat, thing with these like really striking eyes Mm -hmm. um stuff like that there's some really i think powerful images that uh that uh you know tell me that the this younger ito this ito that i love is still kind of in there um but i thought on the whole i I was just i was just so so disappointed in this in this book yeah now i have not gone back to re-listen to last year's horror manga episode and, and maybe i should have uh in preparation for this year's show but i'm pretty sure that i liked fragments of horror better than you did you know it wasn't my favorite junji you mm-hmm. but i wasn't as down on it as you were uh dissolving classroom though is another matter i, I um you know, we should tell our listeners, we usually don't discuss things on this show that we don't like, that we wouldn't recommend. And um, discussing Dissolving Classroom is actually my fault because I kind of pushed this on Shay. Um, he, you know, <laughs> both of us had copies of the book. You read it around the time that it originally came out earlier this year. I had it, but I hadn't yet read it because I got it when it came out. But I hadn't yet read it. And so my argument was, one, I like Junji Ito. And two, I have the book, so it's not like I have to go down and hunt a copy. Mm -hmm. And so when we were deciding what six titles to discuss, horror titles to discuss for this year's episode, 
um, I think eventually you broke down and said, well, why don't we just go ahead and use Dissolving Classroom because we both have it. And mm-hmm. and then once I read it, I went, oh, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not the worst thing I've ever read. I don't want to suggest that, but it's it was disappointing. Again, it wasn't what I was expecting in terms of Junji Ito. And for me, some of the problem emanated from my own, I guess, predisposition to really dislike bodily fluids in narratives mm-hmm. or, or of any sort. You know, growing up, I was not one of those kids who really got a good yuck out of people farting in public or spitting or pee jokes or peeing on things or anything like that. There's just something as a kid, and even in today as an adult, about bodily fluids. I mean, I'm not phobic in any way, so it's not like, you know, blood repulses me, but when you're talking about snot or mucus or defecation or urination, they're just not high on my entertainment list, right? Uh, they, <laughs> they don't please me or intrigue me or scare me. They, they kind of gross me out, and it's like, you know, I, I just don't like that kind of stuff. And I think with Dissolving Classroom, you know, I said one of the things it has in common with Panorama of Hell is bodily excretions. In Panorama of Hell, that's by and large blood. Dissolving Classroom, it is a snot-like liquidy mm-hmm. brain. that, And not just the brain that dissolves, that's the title of Dissolving Classroom, and leaks out people's orifices, right? Their eyes and their nose and their mouth. Um, but also their, their whole body turns to this kind of greasy ooze. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of greasy ooze in this text. And Mm -hmm. uh, it just kind of grossed me out. And, you know, as you mentioned a second ago, I just felt that Ito was falling back on the gross out factor a little too much at the expense of the story itself, you know, the storytelling abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, like you. I have I have a kind of similar. um, Yeah. antipathy shall we say to like bodily fluids i have a i have a, I have a harder time in uh with with s- some of this stuff in like movies than i do in comics and you know s- certainly because in comics you get things like panorama of hell where you have all of this blood but it's rendered as just this kind of like solid chunk of like black ink um it's not as like detailed or as realistic and, and it's abstracted enough that i i have a I have a, a much easier time reading stuff like that. Um, but uh, Dissolving Classroom, uh, you know, Ido's work has always been kind of gross. And, and uh, I have had certain uh, – it has has revolted me in, in certain ways um, for that reason um, that I just mentioned. Um, but I, I think the other elements of his work were, were strong enough that I kind of put up with that and I overlooked it or I moved past it or I, you know – I, I, I managed it. Um, but in Dissolving Classroom, that's really all. It's just, it's, that's all there is. It's just gross, goopy <laughs> mess. Um, and so it was just, uh, I was, I was totally, totally disappointed with this, this book. Um, because we've, we've spoken so, so highly, you know, I think listeners of this, 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 uh, the monthly manga shows mm-hmm. know that we are huge Junji Ito fans. Right. Um, and so just to, to get to this was just so, so disappointing. Yeah. Um, you know, now we've we've talked a lot about the gross factor and what we're kind of turned off by in terms of Dissolving Classroom. Let's talk a little bit about what this is about, um, you know, before we move on to the next book, which is the Lovecraft adaptations. Um, this is a collection of five different stories, although there are two extra stories at the very end of this volume that are really not connected to the first five stories about the dissolving this or that um, in any way whatsoever. It's like, okay, it's almost as if either Ito or the publisher said, you know, we have some page space. Why don't we throw in a couple of really short pieces Mm -hmm. that may have nothing to do with what the other stories are about? Um, But, you know, I I tried to connect this one to Panorama of Hell earlier because of the bodily fluid thing, uh, but also in terms of it being a story or a graphic cycle. And I think that Dissolving Classroom is a better example of a graphic cycle than Panorama of Hell. 
you know, each of these stories, each of the first five, let's say, can can stand on its own, but together make a larger, more coherent, if we want to call it that, narrative. Um, and, and this is the story of a brother and sister. And the older brother is Yuma Azawa, and then he has a younger sister named Chizumi. And first off, let me say something about Chizumi. She's a freak. Uh, you know, it's the younger sister. And not only does she <laughs> act the freak, but the way that Ito draws her is, I think, in classic Ito style. I mean, he does make her out to be this horrific, freakish person. And she's always shown, or at least often shown, with these kind of bloodshot, really wide, big eyes uh, with a demonic grin on her face. And sometimes her hair is spiking, almost like a witch, you know, like unkept hair. And what mm-hmm. she does is she frightens people, and she gets a kick out of this, right? She goes around and taunts them and scares them. Um, and so Yuma tries to keep her in line. Now, we learn that Yuma and his sister Chizumi are orphans, that something happened to their parents, and we don't know exactly what. Although in one of the stories, and I can't remember if it's a third or the fourth one, um, we do get to see the parents, although they're more the parents, the spirit of the parents and not the parents themselves. Um, now, the thing that I think brings in the whole greasy, oozy, goopy, bodily fluid mess is Yuma. And when in the first story, Yuma starts attending a new school, um, he stands out because he's all the time apologizing. So he will bow very low and he said sometimes even get on his knees with his head Mm -hmm. to the ground saying, I am so sorry. I apologize. And half the time we don't even know what he's apologizing in the people around him. They don't know what he's apologizing about, uh, or even to, right. Uh, because he just apologizes indiscriminately all the time. Sometimes it's because of the behavior of his sister. Uh, at other times it could be because he did something, maybe he dropped something or he tripped over something or he bumped up against someone, but he's all the time apologizing. And then we learn, especially in this first story of the collection, Dissolving Classroom, that the more he apologizes, the more apt people are to turn, or at least their brain to turn, into this goopy, oozy mess. Mm -hmm. And this first manifests itself with people having what they think of as runny noses. And so they say, oh, I've got allergies or I'm coming down with a cold or something. But it's actually the first part of their brain starting to ooze out of of their orifices. Um, So that's when things turn really gross. And so um, what what is even grosser is that his sister, Chizumi, likes to lick the human greasy ooze because as a young kid, and I think this is what happened with the parents when they turned to this goopy ooze and greasy gunk, um, as a, as an infant, she ended up eating it and developed a taste for it. And so as the stories progress, basically what happens is Yuma and Shizumi have to keep moving because they're the cause of people turning to mounds of goop, And so they flee, they take up residence elsewhere, and then something similar happens, right? The people that they encounter end up having their brains melted, their bodies turning to this greasy goo, and then they move on. Even weirder, they start to bottle the human goo to where Chizumi can swig these bottles whenever she's hungry. And even creepier, if... if, if, we can get any creepier than that is the fact that the goo in these bodies are sentient and communicate with other bottles. And so the, the bottles have the bodily remains of the various different individuals that they have killed or turned to this goopy mess. Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, when we talk about Jinji Ito being very unusual in terms of his premises and the actions that occur throughout his stories, I think he turns it up not to 11, but to 12 or 13 uh, in Dissolving Classroom. I mean, it really is over the top to the point that I'm going, really? Um, and I think the, the stories, uh, at least the five uh, main ones, are all about this whole dissolving thing. Oh, and I didn't mention that 
Yeuma. Um, also, part of his apologizing and how that turns people to goo is linked to the devil. Okay, and we yeah, don't. That was the only part of this I I, uh, I liked. <laughs> yeah, um, and so that is what his or how his apologizing causes people to turn to goo and melt because by apologizing it's inferred that he's actually paying homage to the devil. And so people within his range that he's apologizing to are affected by the devil's presence, which I guess is melting. Um, And so the various stories at the beginning, we start off with the dissolving classroom. Then we have the story dissolving beauty where it, it says it sounds, you know, these attractive women who begin turning ugly or their beauty dissolves, uh, being around Yuma, and then a dissolving apartment, and that's where we see Yuma and Chizumi's parents or the spirits. Then Chizumi in love, and then finally interview with the devil. And so those are the five stories that make up the core of Dissolving Classroom. Uh, but in all of them, there is humans that are whose brains are melting, who are being turned to a greasy goo. Uh, it is. Uh, it was a challenge to read this collection. Uh, yeah, I I don't have really anything more to add than um, my my vocal disappointment. Um, but I will say I was I looking. I'm looking right now on the uh, the Amazon page for Dissolving Classroom and, and looking at some of the reviews and and these reviews are blowing my mind. They are people really really enjoyed this book. <laughs> Well, they may be the same people who who really get off on uh, you know fart jokes and pissing on things, and that's funny, or defecation um, bits of humor. I don't know. This is this is a good. This it's five stars, and the entire review is awesome! Exclamation point! Thanks! Exclamation point! Love this book. Um, but most people seem to acknowledge that it's it's not as good as Ito's other work. It's inferior, um, but they. They all seem to really enjoy it. So who knows? Maybe we're the we're the crazy ones. Yeah, we're the outliers. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I for the record, I I will I will be crazy. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say lie and say that this is a uh, I enjoyed it just to just to fit in with the crowd. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, we didn't mention that the translator of this book is Melissa Tanaka. So. There you go. And I wonder if uh, she got a little nauseated tra- translating this book. Well, let's move on to something, I think, a tad more enjoyable at the very least. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is H.P. Lovecraft, Lovecraft's The Hound and Other Stories. This is illustrated and adapted by uh, Go Tanabe. And this is the third Dark Horse title that we're discussing this month or this uh, on this episode. This originally came out in Japan in 2014, but it came out not too long ago. Uh, in the U.S. this year. Uh, the translator of these adaptations is Zach Davison, someone whose translative work we have encountered quite a number of times in the past. Mm-hmm. Always does a mm-hmm. very good job. And these are, as the title suggests, adaptations of three of H.P. Lovecraft's short stories. Uh, it starts off with the story The Temple, and then we have an adaptation of The Hound. And then, finally, an adaptation of The Nameless City. Uh, Shay, have you read any other comics or even manga adaptations of H.P. Lovecraft stories? Um, you know, I haven't. Uh, but from what I understand for... Um, uh, for um, horror... Ma- uh, mangaka and um, horror writers of prose in Japan. Um, Lovecraft is is a pretty um, big deal. Um, 
I, I know I've oh God, I'm I'm having a difficult time remembering the name of it, but I know I've played a couple video games where uh, Lovecraftian Lovecraft was was obviously a, a major influence. Mm-hmm. Um, they might have even explicitly referenced um, H.P. Lovecraft, and then I know um, Jajito himself has talked about how uh, big an influence H.P. Lovecraft um, was. So I haven't read any adaptations of his work. Um, any other manga adaptations of his work um, or even comics adaptations. Yeah. Like I've said, I've read, I've read a number of manga where he's clearly an influence. And then in, in, in English comics, American comics, I've read, uh, you know, there's a ton, uh, obviously Hellboy. He's a, his mythos is a big influence mm-hmm. on, um, the Hellboy stories and, and Mike Mignola. Um, so I've read, uh, I've read a ton of comics that, um, that draws on either Lovecraft's, uh, style or um, uh, Love, Lovecraft's kind of Cthulhu mythos in some form or another, but I, I haven't before this read any um, any actual direct adaptations of Lovecraft work. I don't think there might have been one or two that I'm forgetting, but I believe this was was a first for actual adaptations. Yeah. What about you? Well, oh yeah, I've read quite, quite a number of them and we've even discussed some on a good number of them, I guess, collections on the comics alternative. And one of the reasons why I ask is I think that Lovecraft is one of the most adapted writers when it comes to comics and I'm including manga in that. Now, you know, I've done a lot of work on comics and adaptation, especially when it comes to certain writers like Mark Twain or especially Edgar Allan Poe. And another comic scholar that has done a lot of work on Poe adaptations is Tom Inge. And, and in fact, my own scholarship on more recent Poe adaptation basically picks up where Tom Inge's work leaves off. Inge has argued that the most adapted writer, at least American writer, is Edgar Allan Poe mm-hmm. in terms of comics. And I think he may be right. I would venture to guess, though, that coming in second and maybe gaining would be H.P. Lovecraft because you can't turn around in comics without finding a new Lovecraft adaptation. Uh, sometimes these come out individual in individual stories here and there in anthologies. Sometimes they appear in anthologies that are specifically devoted to the world of H.P. Lovecraft and his mythos. Uh, at other times, they are written... Like, for instance, Richard Corbin did a collection for Marvel a few years ago on H.P. Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. It was soon after he did his series of adaptations of Poe, the stories and the poetry. Um, So we have a single author who can even do a lot of Lovecraft in the case of Corbin. But but there are so many H.P. Lovecraft adaptations in comics and manga out there. Um, Unless I'm forgetting something, and I may be because I've read so many of these and it's been a number of years that I've been doing this. The only story, at least in this collection that I've encountered before in terms of a comics adaptation, is The Nameless City. Maybe I've read one of The Hound before and I'm just forgetting it. But um, in this collection, we get The Temple, The Hound, and The Nameless City, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, all classic H.P. Lovecraft short stories. Is there any one of those three that really stood out? for you um yeah that's a good question i think um i definitely preferred the hound and the nameless city to um the first story the temple Mm -hmm. um, which i still which i still enjoyed um (sighs) i'm trying to think i i definitely hmm i think the problem with trying to 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 say that i i really enjoyed any of these stories is difficult because uh, I mean, I liked them and I really, really enjoyed um, Gotenabe's artwork. And I think he does a fine job of adapting HP Lovecraft. Um, but I think because he does a, such a fine job adapting Lovecraft, he ends up reproducing a lot of uh, the kind of narrative deficiencies of Lovecraft that, keep me from really, really enjoying Lovecraft's work. Um, his writing, the way he tells stories, I, I just, they feel um, like they stop short of being really good in a lot of ways. Um, and I think Tanabe, unfortunately, reproduces those in some places. Um, but I think The Hound and um, 
the Nameless City definitely, uh, I, I definitely liked. Uh, I liked many aspects of both of those works. Um, there were sequences in both of those stories that I, I thought were absolutely fantastic, um, the way that Tommy draws them. Um, but I don't, I don't think there was one for me that, that really, really stood out that I can point to and say, like, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, uh, what about you? Was there one in particular that you found yourself enjoying more than the others? Or, Well, I think The Hound... Uh, the the title story, or at least the the one of these short stories that's mentioned in this book's title, is the one that stands out to me. But I, I'm with you in that both The Hound and The Nameless City I enjoyed more than The Temple, even though I did enjoy The Temple. Um, I think that one of the things that intrigued me about that first story, The Temple, is that it had me scratching my head at first because... You know, we do get some bibliographical information about when these stories were originally written and mm -hmm. when and where they were published. So, for instance, at the very beginning of this first story, The Temple, it uh, the editors indicate that this was written in 1920, but it was published in September of 1925 in the magazine Weird Tales. And so right after getting that information, on the facing page, we get four panels of these German sailors on a U-boat and we see a Nazi flag in the background and it's like, wait a minute, the Nazi <laughs> party hadn't even existed in 1920 or 1925. What's the deal here? But then the editors in the back briefly make a mention when, you know, about this book and the artist. Um, the editor does mention that the one liberty, the one, I guess, noticeable liberty that Tanabe took was mm -hmm. in setting the temple in, I, I guess, the 1930s or 40s and not in the 19-teens uh, during the First World War, putting it in the Second World War uh, mm -hmm. or the days, uh, the years leading up to that. So, I mean, I thought that that was effective because showing the main commander of the U-boat, Heinrich, right? That's his name, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, as as a Nazi, I think helped to strengthen the story. Although I do have to admit, I have not read the original H.P. Lovecraft, The Temple. Uh, but I think making uh, you know the commander of the U-boat Heinrich a Nazi um, was was a good move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that is interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm <sighs> like like you mentioned, there was this clear conscious. Uh, change that Tanabe made to Lovecraft's story by changing the setting from, I think in the editor's note, they say that he moved it to World War II from, um, it was originally set in World War I. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's there's obviously a reason that Tanabe did that. And it didn't really occur to me to look for it when I was first reading it. But after I got that note, I began to wonder why Tanabe made that change because he clearly did it for a reason. Um, but that reason... I wasn't really able to discern why he might have made that choice. Did you have a kind of uh, hypothesis on why he, he made that decision? Or, I mean, I'm just speculating here, but I think that there's something much more horrific and nefarious mm -hmm. about Nazis than there are, let's say, you know, the Germans during World War I, right? I mean, they were demonized, but they were demonized in a very different way, right? They were called, you know, the, you know, the violent-prone Huns, or something to that effect. Um, but there's something about a Nazi, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of genre, whether it be horror or otherwise, that is going to kind of accentuate whatever the author is attempting to do. So I think in making this or setting this in World War II and making Heinrich uh, and, and the people on the U-boat, you know, you know, or at least Heinrich and Nazi, maybe, you know, the fellow sailors mm -hmm. weren't members of the party, who knows? But, um, I mean, I, I do think that it adds a little twist to what happens in this story. And, and in essence, you know, this is a story about the um, the U-boat finding, you know, I, I guess one of their own sailors adrift, and there's something in his pocket. And one, I, I think the, the ship's lieutenant, uh, Klintz, mm -hmm. 
takes it and it seems to curse the boat. In other words, the various sailors on the U-boat tend to get antsy, if not panicky, that some kind of evil force is overtaking them or is about to. And, you know, there's mutiny uh, as a result. And so basically we end up, without going into too much detail, Heinrich is the only one left on the U-boat, but the U-boat is crippled, right? So Mm -hmm. it's not as if Heinrich can find his way back safely, but he ends up finding what seems to be this underwater world, which he takes to be Atlantis. Um, And and I think that's where the story of the temple gets its name, because it's this very Mm -hmm. temple. Mm -hmm. that he goes to explore. And it ends ambiguously, which I appreciate. Uh, But I think making Heinrich a Nazi, um, you know, someone who for, you know, many readers embodies evil, you know, the Nazi party Mm -hmm. and what it stood for, uh, Mm -hmm. having this representative of an evil ideology, an evil force, make its way to some kind of ambiguous but nonetheless nefarious otherworldly power, whatever this underwater city is with the lights going on, um, is, uh, kind of just Mm -hmm. in many ways. That's, you know, that's interesting. Um, because I agree that that is kind of a fitting end for, uh, for a Nazi. Um, but there is something to be said about the way that, um, you know, I, I think when, when, uh, you know, me as a reader, when I'm reading a, a comic or a novel or watching a movie or a television show, you know, I, and, and Nazis show up, I have a kind of uh, and I, I think rightfully so. I, I, I tend not to like those characters too much. They they tend not to uh, be the object of my uh, my my sympathies. Um, and so I think there is something to be said for the way that that making a Nazi, the victim of this kind of like cosmic horror, this thing that is so kind of like alien in a way that it, that it, uh, it it drives human beings insane. It puts them into a psychosis to experience. Um, it's not quite as scary when I'm watching it happen to a Nazi. I think it's great. Like, I think that's totally fine. If you know, if that happens to Nazis, the Nazis (laughs) Nazis deserve it. They were not uh, they were not good people. I mean, historically speaking, they were not good people. Um, so I, 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 I'm not going to lose sleep if, uh, you know, this this horrible, horrible thing happens to uh, to a Nazi in the way that I would. I'd be like really shaken if I you know saw the story, maybe victimize someone else who, who I was able to better sympathize with. Um so, uh, you know, again, I, I, that's not really an answer to kind of why he why it's not he made that decision to um, to make these characters Nazis. Um, but it, it does kind of provoke my curiosity even more because for me, at least, it has kind of the opposite effect of of what you would expect or or think that a, a horror author would would want to the, the way he would want to make his, his audience feel it had the opposite effect on me. Um, so I, I am really kind of like puzzled by that, by that choice. Yeah. Um, you know, the other two stories in this collection, the hound and the nameless city. I mean, I agree with you. I think they're more enjoyable stories. Um, another thing about them that you don't find in the temple is that there are more references to the Lovecraft mythos, Mm -hmm. than we find in the temple. So, for instance, in both The Hound and The Nameless City, we have characters who either discuss in detail or at least reference in passing uh, the text, the Necromonicon. Um, And also there are references to the ancient writer Abdul Alhazred. I guess I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Mm, That's about as good as my pronunciation would be. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so I, I do appreciate those references. You know, The Hound is about a couple of characters, young guys who are grave robbers. They end up robbing this one grave uh, with a that has a pendant. Uh, they, they take the pendant. And as you may predict, it causes uh, certain spirits to haunt them like a hound, um, you know, until it's put back. 
And, you know, there is something really spooky about the way that this story unfolds. In The Nameless City, we have the protagonist narrator who visits this city that is mentioned by Al Hazred uh, in one of his texts. But we don't know what the name of the city is, thus the title of The Nameless City. And it's a place where a civilization had once resided, but it's a civilization not of humans, the narrator learns, but of these almost alien, perhaps even Cthulhu-like characters. In other words, um, these beings who resided on, let's say, the opposite side of existence that we're familiar with. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, not necessarily space aliens, although, you know, who knows? It could be something like that. Um, and he is almost literally sucked in to this world, but finds his way out as he's doing his exploration. Um, but, yeah, I think that both The Hound and The Nameless City especially, but even even The Temple is classic H.P. Lovecraft. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. They're all they're all very. Uh, like like I said, I think Tanabe does an excellent job of. uh of, of adapting these stories and retaining those those very Lovecraftian those elements those aesthetic elements that um I think most people whether or not they've actually read anything by H.P. Lovecraft have kind of become familiar with um that uh, that alien that cosmic horror I think is is what it's commonly called mm-hmm. um yeah I think they're uh, they, these three stories are good ex- are really strong examples of uh of that cosmic horror. And I think Tanapi does a, does a great job of, of adapting them. Yeah. Um, And according to the editor of this volume, um, there are other Lovecraft adaptations that Tanabe has done. And dark horse has plans on putting some of these out in the future. Yeah. I I saw that as well. And, and I would definitely be uh, open to checking them out. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, one thing that I, I do want to mention before we, um, move on to our, our final book is uh, uh, the the um, the design of this book, the book design of um, The Hound and Other Stories is terrific. I love, love, love the cover of this book. Um, its use of, of type, its placement, its colors, it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if, so if we get more books in this series that are uh, as well designed as that, I would I would be thrilled. And also of this size. Yeah, I was it's really a smaller size than yeah. about every other book that we're looking at. I think it's 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 closer to I don't think it's the exact dimensions, but it's closer to um, in in height and width uh, the dimensions of uh, like the quote unquote manga size um, books that people are, are familiar with that that tonka bond size that's um, larger than a, a mass market paperback, but smaller than uh you know, a traditional graphic novel yeah, um, or a trade. Idea. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting size. I would be, I would be thrilled to have more of, of the size and design and, and, uh, more adaptations by uh, Gotanabe. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to those. Yeah. Okay, now we move on to the final book that we're looking at on this year's Manga Hara uh, episode, and this is Neo Parasite M. This is a collection of stories and anthology by a variety of different creators. It is going to be coming out from Kadansha Comics in about mid November. And, you know, we should say up front, Shay, that you and I. Not long before we recorded this episode, just got our physical copies of Neo Parasite M. And so we're not as prepared with this one as we are with the other texts. But we did want to include it because it is a brand new book that's about to come out as you're listening to this uh, again in November of 2017. And, you know, it follows up with something that we discussed last year, and that is Neoparasite F. Both Neoparasite F and Neoparasite M, this new book, uh, are stories inspired by Hitoshi Iwaki's Parasite series, which, as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, began in 1988 and lasted until 1995. Um, You know, 
as I admitted, I think last year, I have to say I did not, I have not yet read Iwaki's original Parasite. It's supposed to be a classic horror manga. Uh, maybe that's something that we could take on next year <laughs> uh, is to read uh, at least some of the, the Parasite stories. But the premise of the Parasite stories are that there are these beings that come to Earth and that uh, vow to take over humanity. And in essence, what they are are parasites, right? And they make their way to the brain, and they end up taking over the body of the humans. Well, in Awaki's Parasite, the original, uh, the protagonist is uh, a young man by the name of Shinichi Izumi, and the parasite that inhabits him doesn't come in to where he can take over Izumi's brain. Uh, He basically comes in through Izumi's right hand. And so, I don't know if it's Migi or Miji is the name of the parasite, um, takes over uh, Izumi's right hand, but only his right hand. And so you have this kind of phenomena where you have two beings in one body, uh, and trying to get along, and Amigi, or if you'd pronounce it Amigi, um, doesn't have the same kind of, I guess, evil or nefarious intentions that the other parasites do. Um, so this was apparently a very well-known, well-loved, and successful series, thus spawning these now two volumes of stories that uh, are based on Iwaki's parasite world. I have a question for you. What is the F in Neoparasite F, and what is the M in Neoparasite M? Uh, that's a great question, and I think we asked it last year as well yeah. um, when we were talking about Neoparasite uh, F, and um, I don't believe we had a very good answer at that time, and I still don't. Uh, I, I it's, it's a great question because it means something. Uh, but what that means is is totally lost on me. It might be a reference to something like like you. I haven't actually read um, Milwaukee's uh, the main Parasite series, um, so it may be a reference to that that I'm just uh, we're we're missing because of our um, unfamiliarity. Yeah. Uh, but I but I have no idea. Hmm. Um. But you know, this year's volume Neo Parasite M is very similar to the one that came out last year, Neo Parasite F, in that we have a collection of different creators doing stories inspired by Iwaki's original. Um, and I remember last year making the comment that I did not recognize any of the creators who contributed stories to Neo Parasite F. Um, I can't say that, though, for Neoparasite M, because one of the things I was very pleased to find is the very first story, which is titled Through Yura's Gate, is written and drawn by Moto Hagio, uh, whom we have discussed on the show before and will in a future episode. Yeah, Um, uh, there's a number of like you, I I didn't I don't think I recognized a single name in Neoparasite F, but there are, are, are quite a few in in Neuroparasite M that uh, not only do I recognize, but I'm a big fan of the way they draw. And so I was uh, excited to see them having contributed something to this. Mm -hmm. Um, You mentioned Moto Hagio, but um, Ryichi Ushiba, who spoke Mysterious Girlfriend X, we've talked about on the show, um, contributed to the story. Um, Akira Hiromoto, um, who uh, is, I think, probably best known right now for uh, this, this book, Prison School, contributed something. Um, and then there were a couple others like uh, Hiro Mishima, whose work I'm, you know, I, I'm aware of and familiar with, but I haven't actually read anything by them. So um, there were a number of names here that um, that I, I recognized and uh, was enthusiastic about seeing more of their work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, same here. Another thing that's a little different between this year's volume and last year's Neoparasite F I remember having the feeling that because I didn't know much about the original Parasite uh, world outside of maybe what I could find on Wikipedia, I felt as I was reading those stories that I wasn't really getting everything that I should be getting from them because I was unfamiliar with the original, but I nonetheless went through the motions of reading them. 
Mm-hmm. This time around, I did feel a little more engaged with these stories. And I don't know if it's because I read Neoparasite F last year or that these stories are more accessible. I, I, I'm not sure. But uh, I got more out of this year's volume than last. Um, also, we have, I think, a, a little more of a variety. And in particular, there are two stories about a third of the way through that stand out as very different from the other surrounding it. So, for instance, there is a story called Granny's Regrets by Tagayuki Takeya, and the one that follows that, uh, Peregrant, by Yashushi Narasawa. And these are different kinds of art styles. Uh, so, for instance, um, the one by Takeya, is, it looks like and I guess it is, a series of photographs of um, molded figures. And we learn in the author bio at the very end, in each of these stories have uh, three things. They have a brief one paragraph bio of who this creator is and what they've done. Uh, They have a little information on the question is what draws you to Parasite and the authors say what they like about Parasite. And then the other thing is what are your thoughts on doing this Parasite tribute piece where the authors comment on what they were trying to do and what they hope they got across. But we learn in uh, at the very end of Takeya's bio that this is a creator who does a lot of sculpture art. And so you can see that there is sculpture that is being created and then photographed that becomes the basis for this story. So it's not a comic or manga in the traditional sense, but it is a graphically based narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was... And same thing uh, with the following story by uh, Nirasawa. Yeah, the the Takei one was really interesting, and I'm I'm looking at... at, uh, some of his other work uh, online online right now and um yeah that's a he was a really interesting choice um to contribute to this book because it's it's not uh it, it's it's unexpected i i think it's still a comic but um it's a very different kind of comic mm-hmm. than i think most most readers will uh will be expecting yeah. Now, you know, I mentioned the the piece that follows by Yasushi Nirasawa. Nirasawa is always is also a sculptor, but his piece is more of a traditional comic or manga, I guess. Even though it is like uh Takeya's the only two stories that are presented in color and on glossy paper. Everything else is in what you usually find with manga, um black and white. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a it's slightly different uh, than than Neo Parasite F. Yeah. So if you're a fan of Parasite, then you definitely should pick up this new book that comes out next month, Neo Parasite M. But if you're not familiar with Parasite, as is the case with both me and Shay, uh, I think you can still enjoy it, and it definitely fits into the horror genre that uh, we tend to emphasize this time of the year Mm -hmm. yeah certainly it it definitely fits in within uh within the genre of horror i think um pretty well uh Well, Shay, this is an extra long episode, I guess, as last year's was. I'm looking at the clock now, and we're at about two hours, which we usually (laughs) do not do. But we had a lot to talk about. We looked at six titles. Uh, We started off with Katsuhiro Otoma's Domu, A Child's Dream. After that, we looked at Hideshi Hino's Panorama of Hell and its Buckets and Buckets of Blood. (laughs) After that, uh, Husui Yamazaki's Mail. And then we looked at a book we were a little disappointed in, Dissolving Classroom by Jinji Ito. But nonetheless, it's by Jinji Ito, and we're big fans. 
And then the Lovecraft adaptation, H.P. Lovecraft's The Hound and Other Stories, adapted by Go Tanabe. And then we wrapped up with a brand new tribute volume to Iwaki's Parasite, Neo Parasite M, whose stories are created by a variety of different artists. A lot to a lot to discuss. Yeah, a lot of it was an extra full Halloween treat. That's right, and uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this. Mm-hmm. And if you want to find great manga like this, then you should definitely check out the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Remember, go to dcbservice.com, and there you're going to find a ton of comics at great discounts every single month. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your titles there, get in touch with us and let us know what manga you're reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. And like always, if you want to get a hold of both of us, you can email us at twoguys at comicsalternative.com. If you want to get in touch with me specifically, you can email me at shay at comicsalternative.com. And Derek, what is your email address? Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us all over social media, such as on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. So lots of ways for people to contact us and to tell us about the manga that they like, what they think about our episode, and even recommend manga titles for us to look at in the future. Yeah, and we always, always appreciate when people do that. That's right. Now, Shay and I will be back next month, November, with, uh, I guess, what you can call a regular manga episode. Uh, Not necessarily a themed one, so make sure you check back for that. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. We'll see you later. (laughs) 